us versus them. The other side just doesn't get it. Whether politics, work, or even family, the confusion arises because we aren't seeing how the conflict itself takes over. High conflict is the invisible hand of our time, creating a good versus evil type of feud, and it results in our brains behaving differently, crystallizing certainty in our own superiority and a head shaking about those on the other side. Welcome to the latest episode of the Health, Wellness, and Performance Catalyst. I'm your host, Dr. Brad Cooper, co-founder of the Catalyst Coaching Institute, and today's guest is Amanda Ripley, a New York Times bestselling author, an investigative journalist, and co-founder of Good Conflict, a company that creates workshops and original content to help people get smarter about how they fight. Amanda's most recent book is High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out. We discovered Amanda's work as a result of one of the many newsletters we review regularly to compose our weekly Catalyst 5. It's five tips, tools, and resources to help you move toward better than yesterday. They're made up of the four Catalyst cornerstones, move, fuel, rest, and connect, along with a bonus tidbit each week to help get you thinking. If that sounds like something you find beneficial, there's a link in the podcast description that allows you to check it out. And of course, we provide a one-click unsubscribe if you decide it's not your thing after a couple. As always, if you have any questions about your own coaching career or integrating best-in-class coaching into your organization's benefit plan, please feel free. Reach out to us anytime. Results at CatalystCoachingInstitute.com and we can connect with a call or an email to get your questions answered. Now, it's time to turn the tables on the us versus them conflict conundrum on the latest episode of the Health wellness and performance catalyst amanda it is a pleasure to have you on and we were, we were talking a little bit before we kicked off I, this is just such an important topic right now so thanks for joining us thanks for having me brad it's good to be here before we jump into conflict i gotta ask you about this investigative journalist thing like that's got to be one of the coolest titles ever do, <laughs> do, do you just like does that just happen because you're super curious and you love digging in or like how, how, do, how do i add that to my resume yeah, right. No, I know. It does sound cool, doesn't it? I should have a t-shirt that says <laughs> investigative journalist. Um, I think it's a combination of luck and timing. And also, yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of at my best when I'm like knee deep in the muck, you know? And so I'm not great at writing three or four stories a day. Some people are great at that. Um, that's not my strength. So uh, I like the chase of trying to find mm answers to mysteries, even small mysteries. And, um, so I've been fortunate to be able to do that kind of work, which is, you know, expensive and time consuming yeah. and yeah. in many ways kind of anachronistic, um, <laughs> but I love it. So I'm grateful. It's a caper. Nice. Very nice. Well, let, let's, let's jump into this conflict thing. It, it feels like it's everywhere around us. Has it always been that way? And we just tuned into it because we're seeing it on social media, we're seeing it on 24 seven news cycle, or has something changed in the last decade? For sure, things have changed. Yeah, for sure. It's not your imagination. <laughs> there is more conflict. And more importantly, I mean, because conflict is good. We need conflict. Yep. You could argue we need more conflict. It's the kind of conflict Healthy. that I've come to really think a lot about. So the kind of conflict we're in is, is not healthy. Um, and that has increased dramatically, yeah, unfortunately. So you, 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 you talk about in your book, it's possible for people to short circuit the feedback loops of outrage and blame if we want to. I, I want to. I think our listeners want to. <laughs> so can you get us? I know we need your book, but can you get us started it, down that path of, OK, I don't want to fall into you're an idiot or being right. all angry at whatever. How do we get started with that? Yeah. So, I mean, it's like so many things that unfortunately, I don't know why I say unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> it, it starts in, in your own head. So I guess, unfortunately, because in some ways it'd be easier if you could just change other people, mm. but since you can't, and I apologize, my neighbor's dog is barking, but yeah. So basically, you know, there's two, roughly two kinds of conflict to know about and to recognize the signs of both has been incredibly helpful for me as I try to live in my own head and be useful out in the world. Um, so good conflict or healthy conflict is the kind of conflict where there is friction, there is anger, there's frustration, all that, all that is good. We can work with that. 
it's like good stress, right? It's how you get stronger as an organization, as an individual. It's uh, more questions get asked, right? You get pushed, you get challenged, you challenge other people, all good, right? Uh, and then there's high conflict, which is the kind of conflict that escalates to a point where it becomes its own reality, becomes conflict for conflict's sake, kind of like a perpetual motion machine, right? And it's a feedback loop that's very hard to get out of. It's very mm. magnetic. And once you get in it, it's just really hard to get out. Um, and it starts to feel like you have no choices. You make a lot of mistakes. All our normal cognitive biases become much more extreme. You literally lose peripheral vision and figurative. Really? Yeah. So you miss options. You miss opportunities. Um, so what are the signs you're in a high conflict? Like what are the things to, to kind of be aware of? Um, one is us versus them thinking and language. So, you know, you kind of split the world into two camps, even if you're talking about 10 people or a hundred million people, it's almost never quite accurate <laughs> to label people in that way. It's a very human impulse to make sense of the world. Right. But you always want to be surfacing, at least in your own head, but ideally for everyone around you, the, uh, the people who don't fit the, the fact that there's not two groups, there's like three or four or five or 17. Right. Um, and kind of getting yourself out of that trap. So there's a, a concept in psychology called splitting which is where when people are dealing with a lot of anxiety and uncertainty, they split the world into good versus evil, right? Black versus white, Democrat versus Republican, that kind of thing. And um, again, it makes it makes the world seem more coherent, mm. but in fact is, is like a hall of mirrors. So you start, things get very distorted. So that that's one thing that I'm always trying to catch myself when I'm, <laughs> when I'm, speaking the language of us and them. Um, okay. And, so, so would that be a red flag? If I hear myself say they, do yeah. I immediately say, wait, 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 Brad, you're, you're already off track here. As soon as you use that word, they, we're not talking about an individual or a thought or a strategy. We're now categorizing whomever into that dualistic thinking. Yeah. I mean, I think especially in conflict. Right. And I was having this debate with a, a conservative friend of mine on on over text because I was saying, you know, it's just it's it's just especially egregious when people start talking about Democrats or Republicans. Right. right? And, and they're not talking about one. They're not talking about Mitch McConnell or Nancy Pelosi. Right. They're talking about roughly 75 million people, um, <laughs> which like you just can't general. Exactly. I mean, it seems like you know what's driving right. them, but you don't. Right. Um, and it's funny cause you can, you can, you can appreciate that when it's your own side, right? Like you realize that I can't generalize about everybody who lives in Colorado. Right. <laughs> um, but when it's the other side, it feels more natural to generalize. So, um, I noticed about five, eight years ago, friends of mine started using us and they talking about politics. Like, mm. well, if we win Congress back, then mm. blah, blah, blah. And I'm mm. like, I'm sorry, I did not notice you were working for the DNC. Like, I don't, <laughs> who is we? Um, so it's a trick of the mind that's important to keep an eye out for. Yeah, you're living in it. You're in DC. Is it escalated even further in that setting? Or I, I guess I may be asking a question that can't be answered. If that's where you live, that's where you yeah. live. But. No, I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah. So partly because people, like a lot of people are obviously very affected by politics and the news and policy and very tuned into it, but also because it's a politically segregated place. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but um, Washington, D.C. is uh, extremely democratic when it comes to national elections. So something like 95 percent of people um, voted for Biden. Right. Um, so and then there's this weird thing where when a Republican administration comes in, there's like this little pocket. Right. And so when Trump was in office, it was like, um, I think. It, the <laughs> the stress of having that motorcade come through, of having, you know, uh, the White House sort of blocked off, of having all the sort of normal stress of living in D.C. became, I think, more salient um, for Republicans and Democrats, you know, mm. because that divide was so, um, so obvious. stressful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Are there ways to avoid this feedback loop in the first place outside of avoiding all social media and not talking to anyone, et cetera? I, I, I see this, as I mentioned, I kind of say this in myself. Once the angst is there, 
Like I, I have that whatever with someone. I, I have trouble shifting my brain somewhere else. Are, are there strategies that we can block it out of the gate without yeah. just putting blinders on and saying, la, 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 I can't hear you, I can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so for this book, I was trying to figure that out. Like, how do we avoid getting into high conflict? And how, if we are in it, how do we get out, right? So I ended up following a handful of people who have made that shift. So they were stuck in really malignant high conflict and they managed to shift into healthy or good conflict. So they didn't, you know, surrender their beliefs or give up or uh, defect, right? But they actually became much more effective in fighting for whatever it is they were fighting for because they shifted out of high conflict. So I followed a, you know, an activist, environmental activist in the UK, a former gang leader in Chicago, a politician in California regular frustrated Republicans in rural Michigan and regular frustrated Democrats in New York City. Uh, And in every case, there were certain tripwires that tended to lead to high conflict, certain conditions. So those are things that, you know, I now coach uh, leaders and teams to watch out for and also journalists to watch out for when they're writing Mm, um, mm, about conflict. So those are, there's four of them. I call them fire starters, but basically in the research, it's pretty consistent that um, when these four things are present, the risk of, um, you know, really high conflict is, is very high. And those four things are binary group identities, which we've talked about, right. The sort of false splitting of the world into good and evil. Um, Corruption, right, when institutions are not perceived to be trustworthy. And um, humiliation is a big one that's incredibly underappreciated. And we can talk more about that if you want. But the fourth one is the presence of conflict entrepreneurs, which is, you know, Mm, people or companies that exploit conflict um, for their own ends. All right. So let's touch on those. We we talked about the first one, as you mentioned, and I'm just jotting these down as we go. Let's talk about the corruption piece because you said perceived. Um, how important is that? Yeah. <laughs> word? How, how important is that word in the description? Is it is it history of corruption? And so I pull that into my thought about you, or is it I just perceive you for whatever reason? Because it seems like the first yeah. one, the binary group identity, could affect my perception yeah. of the second one. Oh, that is really insightful. And most people don't pick up that I said perceived corruption, but you're right. You totally caught me at that because increasingly I'm thinking, uh, I'm curious what you think, but uh, so these things interact. Conflict entrepreneurs can give you a story in a time of angst and uncertainty and fear can give you a story. And they do, that's what they do. Give you a, a narrative where there's a villain and a victim. Right. And it's very clean and clear. And that's, again, that binary group identity. And that creates a, a sense of corruption, even when there isn't as much corruption as there seems. Now, I think if there's no very little corruption at all in institutions, say in the criminal justice system or in the news media or in the business businesses, then I think it's much harder to sell that, right? Like, I think it's just harder. Um, but increasingly, I feel like perception matters more than fact, but they both matter. Mm. Um, but the worse the conflict gets, right, the easier, the more vulnerable we all are, right, to conflict entrepreneurs and to uh, perceived humiliation, perceived corruption. Um, so those things can be manipulated and are being manipulated. I, I just wonder if there's these days, is there even a difference? And I know there is, but it's like the the old thing that the newspaper comes out with an error and then they publish a little retraction three days later that no one reads. Everybody remembers yeah. the headline about, you know, Amanda's this terrible person. Oh, whoops, just kidding. She's not that bad. But everybody remembers two years later when they meet you for coffee or run into you at a conference or something. Oh, you're that terrible yeah. person. Yeah. So does it matter if it's perceived or actual? If it's perceived or real. These days, um, probably not, because when you have a low trust culture like we're in right now, yeah, you know, you're you, it doesn't it's just those narratives are going to stick. Right. So it's perceived equals reality. Now, repairing it, do, it, it does matter. Right. So if if you can increase trust by creating institutions that are more trustworthy, 
it's it's going to create more dissonance mm -hmm. when conflict entrepreneurs are selling you this story. Um, if your life is going better and there's less uncertainty and less unfairness and less violations to your dignity and all the other things, right, that have to do with corruption, then you're less vulnerable to these to these uh, stories. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's lean into the humiliation piece because I did not pick up on that uh, previously. Talk to us about what role that plays as a fire starter. So the humiliation piece is fascinating, and it's basically um, humiliation is the force lowering of someone or some group. So you can experience it vicariously if your group you feel like your group has been brought low, right? So it's important to notice that you were up on high, right? In your own mind, like in your mind, there's a sort of hierarchy. And if you or your group is forcibly brought low, that's humiliation. And humiliation, Evelyn Lindner, who studies conflict uh, all over the world, she calls humiliation the nuclear bomb of the emotions. And it's incredibly powerful. It kind of like supercharges conflict. So it's really, really important to watch out for. It's, and it's been really helpful to me to notice this. So one thing I try to do is always remove an audience. If I'm in conflict with someone, say on Twitter yes, or whatever. Yes, yeah. Yes, like totally. just, I'm going to go to DM. DM. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And any great teacher knows this too. If a, if a teenager in, you know, 10th grade English class picks a conflict, picks a, you know, picks a fight with you, the first thing to do is to remove the audience. So, you know, see if you can talk to them Absolutely. after class or bring them out in the hallway, right? You just do not want that audience because then people can lose face. They can feel humiliated, whether they should or not. There's a great Nelson And, and they're not responding quote. to you. They're responding to they're, their exactly. audience. Exactly. They're yeah. performing. Yeah. Right? They're yeah. performing. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, there's a great Nelson Mandela quote where he said, there's no one more dangerous than one who's been humiliated, even if you humiliate him rightly, which I love that last Interesting. little caveat. Yeah, yeah. So unless you want your enemies to be stronger, try not to humiliate. So I just jotted down, you said you or your group brought down. Um, don't we want our group to be challenged and improved and grow? And so, yeah, I guess the brought, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm fiddling with that in my head. Like, well, yeah. but I have a lot of groups I'm in that I want to have challenged. I want it to get better. I, I don't want to defend the status quo, whether it's political or religious or even our family. But is that, does that require taking a step back? Maybe I may be just be in a weird place where I have that space to think about it, but w how unlikely is that? Well, I think you make a really important distinction there, which is there's a difference between being held accountable, right? And being humiliated. Um, I think we've all experienced both. Yes, that's very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so you, you do want to hold people accountable. Now, where you get into this tricky zone is shaming, right? So a lot of people want to believe that if you shame and shun and call out people, that will make them do better. And just the research just doesn't support no, that. Zero. So uh, there's a real strong instinct around that. And it just, again, tends to make conflict more dysfunctional, tends to energize uh, the person that you're, I mean, there's just a ton of, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, we, we just interviewed Bill thing. Miller, the guy that created motivational interviewing, and he, he just oh, wrote a new yeah. book on the whole idea of thinking things through and, and not being sure is actually a good thing because it allows you to to ponder that. So, all right. So oh, cool. I'll have to look for that. Oh, he, he did a great job. Yeah. And I can send you the episode. It was our 200th. Yeah. Um, okay. So this leads nicely into the next question about swimming upstream. You've written about how difficult it is to swim upstream against our own tribe. So you see the issues, you see the struggle in your own tribe, and you, you feel like you want to go a different direction. We're seeing that on a national level in some, and I don't want to get political in this episode, but we're seeing some very political and, and organizational things happening with that on the national scene. I feel the tension. I, I think we all do. Can you give us some guidance that would help start that process when we see our tribe? So I'm in a tribe. We're all in various tribes. I see my tribe taking things too far in the wrong direction. What 
what, what, what can I do? What, what are steps that I can take with that? Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the relationship you have with other people. I mean, again, you know, shaming them, calling them out, isn't going to work. So, okay, we take, let's take that off the okay. table. Um, I think you can express sadness. I think you can express worry. <laughs> I think you can express concern, right? Because you're right. One of the diabolical hallmarks of high conflict is you will eventually start to mimic the behavior of your so-called opponents. You will start to do the thing that you went into the fight to stop, right? You, whether it's harming your kids or your country, whatever it is, betraying your values. So it is important to notice that when it's happening. Now, when it is your side or your tribe, you have a lot more influence potentially than when it's another across the divide tribe or group, you're not going to influence them. Anything you say is probably going to make it worse. But if you have a relationship, if it is your group, right, then it's more about, can you hearken back to the original values and goals of this group? You know, can we remind ourselves of what we hold dear? Um, can we amplify and raise up the voices of people who are not doing this thing, right, within the group who are like, really trying to live in complexity and hold the tension who are really trying to uh, be humble and, and show that they are curious and show that they don't have all the answers or uh, treat other people with dignity and decency. So, so some of it is like raising them up, whether it's in your social media feed or in your organization, can we amplify those voices? Can we be those voices, right? Can we, as opposed to trying to bring someone else down. Um, I don't know if that, I mean, sort of unsatisfying <laughs> as an answer, but uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm just thinking of a couple of the, the national examples we've seen lately. They're being kicked to the curb. There, there is no, I, I think a lot of us are cheering them on in silence behind the scenes, but at the top of the tribe, they are, they, I think they're the voice of reason, but the top of the tribe is coming in going, yeah, boom. Yeah. So that's how it works. So anytime you're in high conflict, anyone who challenges their group gets just piled on and it's a very lonely place to be. So, you know, what I always try to do and I don't always succeed, but I always advise other people to do as well is to really support those people because it's incredibly lonely and courageous to challenge your own group in that way. It's not, it's just, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing easy about it. And most people who do that end up because it's so painful, literally physically painful to be ostracized by your group in conflict. They end up going back to high conflict. And mm -hmm. I talk in the book about Glenn Beck, who, you know, kind of built his career as a conflict sure. entrepreneur sure, sure. and then tried to shift to something else. And it was just very difficult, um, excruciating. So everyone I followed who made that shift successfully and didn't go back to high conflict had people who welcomed them home, you know, had people who said, you know, we're going to create a third tribe, right. Okay. Or welcome to our like small, <laughs> however small right, it might right. be welcome to our small family. And that is so important. Right. All right. Uh, you, you mentioned these folks you follow, the, the, the gangs, families, communities, politics. Can, can you share a couple of these that might encourage our listeners to provide some hope that things can get better, that there is a path toward less conflict or at least healthy conflict? Yeah. So the, the path for all of them <clears throat> was the, the sort of steps, the things that happened first, second, third. And that's what I was trying to see. Like, is there any pattern here? Yeah, yeah. And the first thing was usually there's some kind of shock to the conflict. So conflict's like a system, right? And there needs to be some shock that temporarily upsets those feedback loops. And it can come in all different forms. You know, it can be for gang violence in Chicago, it can be a snowstorm. So that, you know, five days go by and no one gets killed. Those shocks are really, really important. And you got to plan for them in advance. Um, another example, you know, would be if, uh, let's say, in a high conflict divorce. So the phrase high conflict comes from divorce um, in the 80s. Lawyers noticed that about a quarter of American divorces were stuck in the courts in perpetual cycles of mm. hostility, right, for years and years. And, and those were termed high conflict divorces. So in those kinds of conflicts, it might be a child gets sick, right? 
where something happens to temporarily, and that's an important point, temporarily destabilize the conflict system. And in that moment, people can have what's called a saturation point where they start to really question if the losses of this conflict are still worth the gains. Mm -hmm. Um, And if they have nowhere to go, they'll stay in the conflict. But if there's somewhere to go, if there's some relationship that still exists, some, you know, it'd be great if we had a third party, obviously, in the United States. uh, And I hope we will be in my lifetime. If there's somewhere to go, then, you know, that's when you can really interrupt conflict. And and one of the great examples of this was in Colombia. So I went to Colombia because you know, it's kind of an extreme case where there was a civil war that lasted half a century only recently uh, was a peace treaty signed in 2017. And, you know, all sides in that conflict uh, committed war crimes, you know, the government, the paramilitaries, the communist FARC, there all these groups, right. And you had everything, corruption, conflict entrepreneurs, all the things. And what's really incredible though about Colombia is they've studied and tracked who has left the conflict over those 50 years more than any other country and they've invested a lot in trying to reintegrate combatants into society lots of failures there but they've done a lot more than most most conflict zones so what worked you know and 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 there's a lot of like instinct and intuition and emotion and most of it's wrong So how do you get, how do you get people in those saturation points? How do you get them to step out of conflict, right? And do something differently. Um, There was a researcher named Juan Pablo Aparicio who did this really clever study only very recently that showed that there was this very simple public service ad that ran during soccer games in Colombia. So anytime the national Colombian team played soccer, these ads would run for like nine years, right? And they were really simple. I mean, they basically said, the next soccer game, football game, come home and watch, watch with us, with your family. And they had like mothers and fathers um, inviting their children who were now FARC guerrilla members and living in the jungle and fighting the government to come home. And oh. we're saving a seat for you, that kind of thing. Um, so they were lighting up their latent identity, which is a really good way to pull people out of the spell of high conflict. It's it's hard to create a new identity in high conflict, but all, all of us have many identities. Right. So if you can light up the one of being a family is usually the most powerful one um, outside of the conflict. So also Colombian, right? Because they were, so what they knew from listening, this is important, right? They were the, the government what a concept. listened yeah, <laughs> to enough of the former combatants to know that these FARC members all, all cheered for the Colombian national soccer team. Like it was very close to their hearts, despite the, you know, obviously they were fighting the government and the military, but they cheered for the, for the football team. And so they would always listen to these games on the radio whenever they happened so in the jungle. Yeah. So they knew, so Aparicio could do this cool study where uh, the weather in Colombia is incredibly variable. There's just a lot of different microclimates. So he could look at you know, NASA weather data and see where there was a likely a radio signal on any given day and when the ads ran. And he looked at it over nine years. So he knew he had a great experiment, right? He could see who, in what who parts of Colombia, yeah, yeah, was this heard and what parts was it not. And so uh, what he figured out is that um, in the places where these ads were heard twice as many people were voluntarily demobilizing from the conflict in the days that followed. Um, so actually more people by that estimate left the conflict in Colombia because of these ads than because of the peace treaty that was signed because over time, over nine years, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, so I love that story because, you know, it shows that, when things um, when things get really hard and a country's in a very bad place with a lot of loss and suffering, you can still invite people home. And a lot of people want almost everyone in high conflict wants out and they just need a path. Mm, that's super interesting. They all want out. I, I was just going to ask you because I, w- I want to jump into this this uh, conflict entrepreneur. I'm fascinated with that concept, but. Is there a conflict addiction? Is, is, is that 
like that gets my endorphins going. And so I'm going to, I'm jumping on Twitter and I'm getting after it and I'm going to take on him or her or whatever. Like, does that, because I have no life, not to offend anybody too much, but <laughs> I, you know, I've got nothing better to do. So why not make somebody mad? I do think it's funny you say that because a lot of people wrote to me after reading the book and said, you know, this is just like recovery. Like I, you know, I was addicted. I was an alcoholic or I was a drug addict. And it's like a very similar process that you're describing of like hitting rock bottom and needing somewhere to go and kind of vacillating for a while between the two worlds and different identities. Um, And so I hadn't really put that together until they helped me see it, which was really cool. And I do think that, look, high conflict gives you meaning, gives you purpose, gives you a sense of righteous Mm -hmm. um, conviction. And that's, you know, very energizing. I mean, it's great to feel like you're, you're on the side of the angels, you know, and by the way, everyone in high conflict feels that way on all sides. Um, so, uh, it's, it's particularly in times of uncertainty and disconnection, which is what we're living in. It's very, very hard to resist, um, because it gives you clarity. Like that's what people want. People want coherence. They want to have, have it explained. Why am I feeling this way? And we know about humans and you know, from, from all of your shows, I'm guessing that like humans are pretty good at knowing something's not right, but they're really bad at interpreting the cause, right? Like emotionally. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> completely. So, so that makes us really vulnerable to conflict entrepreneurs. And to answer that question. Yeah. I mean, conflict entrepreneurs, the ones who are career conflict entrepreneurs, are typically damaged in some way, right? They have some history that they have not dealt with or aren't either haven't been able to deal with or aren't willing to deal with that leads them to insatiably want more and more attention, importance, sense of power, profit. You know, when you create whole companies and institutions that do this, it's it's an even harder problem because then it's not just, you know, one extreme narcissist who needs to go to a therapist, right? It's a whole sort of culture that's raising up narcissism, which is what we're seeing in certain institutions now uh, in in the U.S. Well, and it seems like with the addiction piece, it's also you're doing something easy as not all addictions, but generally, if you think about alcoholism or, or smoking or whatever it, it it's, you're not choosing those things. Cause like, it's really difficult to pour another glass of, whatever yeah. you're, you're doing it. Cause you're doing something, you get that reward, but it's also simple. And so it seems like this is also simple. I can yell at you on you know, Twitter or, or Facebook or whatever, and feel like I did something, but I didn't really, I didn't volunteer my community. I didn't come help my neighbor. I didn't support somebody at church. It, it was literally just yelling at somebody, but I did something. Is right, there it gives some you the illusion of, of um, illusion of agency, right? Yes. Like the illusion of control. And so, yeah, for sure. I mean, look at all the yard signs, right? Like all the signs yeah. that have come up over, you know, over the last five, 10 years. Um, and I think, you know, some of that is maybe okay, because when people feel powerless, they want one thing they can do, right? And that's a very noble and understandable human instinct. But some of it is just destructive, right? Um, and it, it is an, an illusion, right, to your point, where it feels like you're taking action. I see a lot of this now because a lot of, there's just a lot of misplaced conflict right now um, in organizations and companies, nonprofits, campuses, high schools, because there's so much angst and energy and electricity in the air and people are so frustrated and so convinced they, that they are right And they want to do something to your point. And so they're going to kind of like look for a target of convenience, whether it's their school board or their CEO or their neighbor, you know, and usually that's not the real root of the problem, but it's a way to feel relief from that frustration. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did something. All right. So you, you've described this conflict entrepreneur, but I want to sit in this a little bit because I, I love, 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 love that phrase. Did you come up with that phrase? Is that your phrase? No, that's, that's like a phrase that's used a lot in the international study of conflict zones. Cause like in violent conflict, what I did is just apply it to more kinds of conflicts. Yeah. <laughs> well, good job. I, when I first read that, <laughs> because I think just the awareness, just knowing that we're having this interview and, and reading through a lot of your stuff, 
it helped me when I came across a conflict entrepreneur, yes. it, it, it reformatted it for me. Instead of me feeling like, oh no, well, I need to answer that. What should I do with this? I don't, I don't know <laughs> what to do. This is, this is hurting my feelings. I'm not sure yeah. how to address it. I just, I literally took your phrase and was like, well, this is interesting. I just uh-huh. come across a conflict entrepreneur. So just the knowledge of what you shared in your book helped me deal more effectively, like format or put it in a category or, or something. But can you give us like more depersonalize tips? It. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's just like, well, this is this person's job. They just, yeah. that's what they do. Um, yeah. it, it's like the old saying, you don't yell at a squirrel for climbing a tree. You don't yell at a fish for swimming. It's just who they are. And, <laughs> and so if, if this person, that's just what they do, yeah. I shouldn't be offended that they chose me as their target in this case. But can you give us some insights on on how to deal with somebody who is benefiting from creating conflict. Any, any tips to help us yeah. get past that? Yeah. Well, it's funny because in, in the book, I just noticed that everyone who shifted out of high conflict, one of the first things they did after hitting that saturation point or that shock we talked about is they distance themselves from the conflict entrepreneurs in their mm. lives, mm. right? Whether it was their lawyer or their political advisor or, you know, who they were watching on cable TV news, whatever, mm. So I put that in the book and I was like, there you go. You're welcome. (laughs) Distance yourself from conflict entrepreneurs. And of course, a bunch of people rightly wrote to me and were like, okay, thanks. What if I can't distance myself from Mm. a conflict entrepreneur? What if they're my boss or my My member of Congress? Or yeah, yeah, right. Any number of people. So I just did the one thing I know how to do, which is go report it out. And I went back to all the people I'd followed, all the people who uh, you know are just like gurus on conflict all over the world. And I said, what do you do with these conflict entrepreneurs? Yeah. yeah. And so Gary Friedman, who is a conflict expert, who's in the book, who ran for political office and immediately got sucked into to high conflict, but then <laughs> credit pulled himself back into good conflict. He said, you know, well, first of all, don't create a new us versus them, you know? And he, it really mm. annoyed me when he said that. Cause I was really enjoying just blaming the conflict entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. You know, exactly. He's like, be careful with that. Cause right. you can't fix an adversarial us versus them culture with a new one. Right. Right. Even though we keep trying, it doesn't work. It's the same. It's the same problem over and over again. So the first thing I do is try not to be a conflict entrepreneur, right. Myself. And it's very easy right now as a journalist, as a Twitter user, mm. as a human. So try not to be one. Realize that people who are now conflict entrepreneurs probably won't always be, right? And then this is the hardest thing that they all said, unfortunately, is uh, <laughs> you got to spend more time with conflict entrepreneurs, not less. Like assuming you can't just turn down the volume, you you need to understand them a little better, not perfectly you don't spend a hundred hours but if say they're an employee in your organization and you you can't you can't separate them from the organization for whatever reason it's really important to understand a little bit better to make them feel heard right super important uh different ways to do that but it is almost never happens especially to conflict entrepreneurs so listen to them ask them different questions we can talk about what questions but you're trying to get at as gary said if they're 90% conflict entrepreneur, see if you can speak to the 10%. What is that? Like, what else are they? Do they own a dog? <laughs> Do they like to garden? Like, what else, right? What were they before this? You're not going to fix them, unfortunately, right? But you could invite them to see you as a human, and you could try to see them as a human. And maybe there's some task or some project that they could work on to channel some of that energy away from destroying things, right? Into building things. Maybe not, right? But a lot of conflict entrepreneurs can be redirected or managed. And if you really are struggling with it, the place I send people is uh, an organization called the High Conflict Institute, which deals with high conflict people um, and kind of does workshops and trainings and coaching and is just really good at like quick, easy ways to kind of, you know, systematically have habits to, res- to manage high conflict people and conflict entrepreneurs. Um, most people don't fall into that category though. Like just because someone's trying to unionize or someone files an HR complaint doesn't mean they're a conflict entrepreneur. It's really, if it's a pattern over time, most conflict entrepreneurs are not happy. You know, they're kind of miserable. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. You don't see them laugh a lot. Right. You notice like, right. like genuinely. Um, so that's, there are certain, you know, signs anyway, I ended up writing this up for the Harvard business review because, um, yeah, you know, again, I failed to really dig into it enough, I think, in the book. Um, but I I did. <laughs> I always think about, you know, Curtis Toller, who's a former gang leader who's in the book. I asked him about this because he was, you know, by his own admission, he was a conflict entrepreneur uh, for many years in, in Chicago. And now he prevents gang violence uh, at great personal risk in Chicago. Um, and he said, you know. I got to understand these people better. I got to, what he does in his own, when he's starting to get really frustrated with a conflict entrepreneur, he tries to, in his mind, imagine what they looked like when they were four. Mm. Interesting. It's like as a trick to yeah. get his mind back into humanizing them. Um, and then he's trying any which way he can to connect with them. And Interestingly, this is the same in like crisis de-escalation. Like if it's somebody's freaking out and might get violent in your like ER, the the best way to deal with them is try to very quickly build rapport, mm. like connect with them. And well, then it, it yeah. seems like that's that's the answer. Like if there's an answer, it's that. It's that personal connection. If if you and I sit down and have a cup of coffee together. And I get to know some of the things you mentioned, your dog, your background, where you grew up, the fact that you enjoy cycling. All of a sudden, we have this thing in common. Instead of just the one big monster here in front of us, there's all these other things. And, oh, yeah, there is also this other thing that we don't agree on. But but I don't know. We Can we... We, we can't get there or, or we're not choosing to get there. We're, we're choosing just to follow another hundred people on Twitter and pick out the arguments. And I, I, I don't know. What am, what am I missing there? Well, can we create I mean, I that? I do think like to your point, I mean, some of this, some of it is relationship building, rapport building. Right. And some of it is just kind of turning down the volume on conflict entrepreneurs, like stop incentivizing this behavior for God's sake. And that is a more kind of systemic change that needs to happen. But if you think about it, that starts with individuals. So like to you gotta to tame it, you gotta name it, that old thing. So now when I see, just like you said, when I see a conflict entrepreneur on Twitter or on the news, I just, I just it's just not appealing to me at all anymore. Like it's mm -hmm. lost. Right. It's a loss, you know, or even someone who's just kind of like comedians who make fun of people, mm -hmm. you know. Um like I, I just, I lost my taste for a lot of these late night shows that like I mock people who support Trump or mock, you know, it's just, I don't think it's funny and I can see how it's exploiting the conflict and it's inflaming the conflict. And it's just like, I, I think more and more people are starting to notice that this is messed up and it's not, um, it doesn't feel good, you know, like in your soul right. to kind of live in that place. Right. And, and I know this is naive, but I think as more and more people recognize this, then you end up reducing the demand for it, you know, but that's a slow process, unfortunately. Well, and again, I'm going to get a little bit off topic here in an area I said I wasn't going to go into, but it seems like if we do think politics, we have these extremes on both sides and then there's the rest of us. They're kind yeah. of the thoughtful middle that are are curious about what the in quotes other side is saying and there's something to that and that kind of makes sense and yet we're driven by the two extremes and we're forced to choose between the two extremes and we're, you and I aren't going to solve this today but it's just it, it, it it's fascinating um many of our listeners are coaches leaders parents they're, they're people that are supporting others what would be some core tips they could provide their their clients their kids their coworkers who are falling into this. So now you're not talking to me. You're talking to me to give me advice to provide our adult kids or someone I work with or something that they're really struggling yeah. with this. Yeah. So a lot of people have family members who sort of fallen down, you know, YouTube rabbit holes yes. and other things. And are just, it's, as they describe it, they've lost their mind, you know, to, to whatever. I mean, I've heard it on MSNBC. I've heard it on Fox. I've heard it. In, and I'm not saying they're the same, but like, I have definitely heard this happening on the left and the right. I've seen it happen on the left and the right. So the first thing to, to get really curious about is what is the understory 
of this person's conflict. Like, yeah, the thing they're obsessed with that they keep talking about is maybe, you know, a theory that the world's going to end on this day. I'm just to take an extreme case. Right. Um, and they want you to hear them. Right. So the first thing I'm going to do is loop them. I'm going to remove the audience and I'm going to loop them. If I, you know, if I have a relationship with them, ideally. Um, so I'm going to say, you know, man, it sounds like you're really freaked out. Like it it must be terrifying to think the world's going to end on November 2nd or whatever. Um, so that's the first thing, because half of what people want in conflict is to be heard and they almost mm, never get it. Right. So yeah. let me just give them that. Okay. Notice I didn't say, yes, the world's going to end on November right. 2nd. Right? right. And people know that you're not agreeing with them. But once there's a, just a ton of research on this, like once people feel heard, they lower their guard. They mm. say more revealing, vulnerable things. Mm. But it's like a game of chicken. Like you're not going to get that until you they feel heard. So trying to argue with them, trying to give them like other news sources, none of that is going to work, especially if they haven't felt heard. They're just going to get more and more extreme in what they're saying. So first I'm trying to loop them. And then, and I check, right? I'm like, is that right? Like, do I have it right? Because usually it's not quite right. Like they haven't said it quite right. And I haven't understood it quite right. And we keep doing that till I get it, get it right. And then they feel heard, right? And then I'm trying to get really curious. Like the understory of a high conflict is how I think about um, the deeper forces that are energizing the conflict. And we almost never talk about those, which is why we get stuck, right? Mm-hmm. In these endless, boring battles over so many things, right? Like Israel, guns, abortion, like it's the same back and forth. Exactly. Just, right. It's like, oh my gosh, but it's like a glacier. Like there's a huge understory that's underwater. That's where the good, interesting stuff is. So can we try the to figure stuff. out? Yeah, yeah. Like what, usually it's about the same things, right? It's about care and control, respect and recognition. It's about um, fear. It's about humiliation, which we've talked about, or a search for dignity and, and a belonging. Right. So can I try to like, get really curious about what it is for this person? Like, when did you start, you know, noticing this? Um, there's one person who I care deeply about who fell into one of these rabbit holes. And you know, when he started getting into it, when he had COVID and he was in isolation for 10 days alone, right. At the same time, lots of other problems were happening in his life. Like things weren't going well, but like not a coincidence, (laughs) I don't think. Um, And it doesn't fix it. Right. Because if you say that to them, well, I think this this is just because you were lonely. Right. Like that's really not going to go well, but (laughs) it helps me understand what they're searching for, you know, and maybe there's a way to once we figure out what's missing, maybe there's a way to help fill that hole without fear and more blame and misinformation and plots and conspiring, (laughs) you know, maybe I can do for them what conflict entrepreneurs are trying to do, but in a healthier way. Right. Right. Last one. So we had Kelly McGonigal on and we were joking about how most research is actually me search. Uh, (laughs) Is there a backstory here somewhere in your own journey where it kind of set you on this path of discovery around conflict or, or things you, I'm also curious, this kind of a secondary question where you see yourself stumbling, even though like I'm an expert in some areas and I still stumble in those areas. Are there things in conflict where you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm just doing chapter seven. (laughs) Absolutely. Like all of my books have been where I run up against a problem that I can't personally live with and I can't make sense of. And it took me an embarrassingly long time to realize that, but nevertheless, three books, each one was about like a (laughs) wicked problem that I couldn't just kind of come to terms with. Um, And so this one is about conflict because you know, during the Trump Hillary Clinton election, it just felt like the whole world had gone crazy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how my whole identity was kind of staked in being a journalist and having impact in the world and being, you know, a purveyor of facts. Right. And it felt like none of that mattered the way, the way I wanted it to. Totally. 
And that anything I might do as a journalist was either going to have no effect or, you know, any story I might write about politics or it was going to make things worse. Mm -hmm. Right. Even if I'm not intending for it to make things worse. Um, So it was very destabilizing and disorienting to think, you know, like anytime there's a real, I think, a crisis to your identity. Right. It's there's an opportunity there and there's a a real danger there. Yeah. Yeah. So. So that's when I kind of went off on this, you know, midlife gap year of like trying to understand (laughs) conflict. Like, what was I missing? And it turned out a lot, like a lot. (laughs) And so uh, this looping thing I mentioned has totally transformed my life professionally and personally. Like it changes how I do every interview. It changes how I talk to my family, how I talk to strangers. Um, It makes me much more present because I'm trying to really understand what the person said and prove that I have. And now I've trained, you know, hundreds of journalists on it. I started a company with a journalist colleague called good conflict where we do workshops on this. And it's really exciting to see how much better people can get pretty quickly. And it's such a good go-to skill, particularly when you get, when you kind of fall under attack and didn't see it coming, (laughs) if you're a leader or whatever, have any kind of public profile, or even if you don't, um, it's really useful to have practiced that skill. So that is also where I fail, right? Like I think, you know, conflict, probably my worst conflict in behavior to this day is where it matters most, right? With my husband, (laughs) right? Like we've gotten a lot better. I've gotten a lot better, but like, he's gotten a lot better. But still, when I'm really upset, I I don't loop. I don't. And I really want to. And I hope I can come on your show in five years and be like, okay. I got it. I do it in every fight we have. And he's actually better at it than I am now, which is just really galling. But, you know, <laughs> he'll do it. And I'm like, oh, shoot. Yes. Now I have to do this for you. <laughs> but it slows down that escalation. and you know, I've been married to this person for 22 years and still there are things I don't know and vice versa. So if I don't check to make sure I'm understanding what he's saying, I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to jump to conclusions. And then you're, you know, you're just kind of like doing that thing where you're fighting about the wrong thing and not having the fight you really need to have. We will, we should talk about that. Maybe we can have you back at 30 years with your husband. <laughs> we, we literally just a few weeks ago uh, released a marriage lessons learned because Suzanne and I have been married 30 years. Oh, and nice. The, the, one of the things I mentioned there is you're never married to the same person twice. Oh, it's the old awesome. river saying you never step in the same river twice because it's constantly yeah. changing. Suzanne is completely different than she was certainly 30 years ago, but also last year and also last yeah. week. And, and that's too. great. And yeah. that's awesome. And I love yeah. that about her, but yeah. it, it is funny. So, well, thank you for pulling back the curtain a little bit on that one. We'll, we'll definitely talk about that. Amanda, yeah. this is awesome. This is so, so important. Thank you for trying to bring some of this stuff to light for us and really appreciate your time. Well, thanks for letting me riff on this with you. There's <laughs> lots there, um, but it's really good to be with you. Such important information and insights, especially right now when it seems we're seeing more conflict and division than ever. Thank you, Amanda Ripley. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks to you for tuning into the number one podcast for health and wellness coaching. And uh, as always, we, we appreciate it so much when you're sharing it with others. We do not market it. It's simply through word of mouth that this has grown over the five years. Next week's guest was brought to our attention by our son, who's currently in med school and was doing research on sleep and the effect of our affect. Incredibly fascinating discussion with Dr. Carly Hunt that you do not want to miss. We're here if you have any questions about coaching, either for your own professional pursuits or as part of your organizational strategy to help support the physical and mental health of your employees. Email results at catalystcoachinginstitute.com anytime. And now it's time to be that catalyst. This is Dr. Brad Cooper, the Cattles Coaching Institute, signing off. Make it a great rest of your week. And I'll speak with you soon on the next episode of the Health, Wellness, and Performance Catalyst, or maybe over on the YouTube coaching channel.